talk initially, well, is can edtech reinform, be used to reinform instruction, teaching instruction? But over, you know, something I'm, I'm really passionate about, but also in light of the recent events, like maybe I should reframe this and say, well, can edtech be used to reinform ELT? You know, like, are we missing something? Is something missing? And you know, all of us are here today on a Saturday. How many of your friends, partners, people from different sectors are going to extra events free of charge, you know, of their own time? Um, none of them. How many of them are going to CPD workshops in the hope of getting appraised to get no financial gain from it? None of them. So why do we all do it? And it is, comes from that kind of passion that we have for what we do and the teachers or the students that we teach. But somebody tweeted you the other day and said that, you know, you need to support these teachers because potentially it could be you one day. It should never be. It should never be any of us at all. You know, everybody here works extremely hard. And um, what we need to realize as teachers in this sector is that there's a whole world of, world of technology out there. And if you look at the Silicon Valley and all of those people, there's people making a lot of money. There's a lot of investment going into EdTech. None of it's coming back into these classrooms. None of it's coming back into us. And everyone here is creative and has a lot of ideas and stuff. And maybe we should harness the power of all those ideas together to take some of that, go out to that technology and bring it in here so that we're the ones that benefit, so that we create something for this sector that they can't do without us, that this shouldn't happen to anyone again, ever. You know, so EdTech essentially, what I'm going to talk about is what we thought about it, what we do, what we don't do, what we can, and what we should do, very briefly. Um, so initially when, you know, oh, the robots are coming, they're going to take all our jobs, some of us were like, fine, you can have my job, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but then other people are like, oh no, whatever. So that's what some people thought in their mindset. And other, other people, like especially the investors and all that, it's like Glastonbury for EdTech. They're like, oh, throw money at it. It's going to save, you know, uh, computers for everyone. It's going to save education. It's going to empower learning, revive everything. It's going to make it more fun, you know. And... Um, so basically it was seen maybe as this panacea that can just save everything. And what we, can, what we know is that it doesn't, you know, and I'm, I'm a big believer in pen and paper and writing. So I'm never saying that things need to be uh, thrown out the window, but everything needs to supplement and can aid, but we need to do it with pedagogy and we need to do it in the right way. So we can see it as a snake oil, really, just it doesn't work. So what we do... Um, and this was just me going to ask, me, ask you guys what tech you use. But from today, we can see that um, there's a lot of people using the voice thing, Padlet, and maybe some... Is there any other main tech, that, um, tech platforms that people use in their teaching that we haven't mentioned or come across today? Kahoot. Oh, Kahoot. <laughs> Kahoot. <laughs> I, I know teachers that have stopped using that because it sends students absolutely hyper and they just they can't handle it anymore but generally overall aside from some of the ones that we're using a lot of teachers are probably using twitter and, and facebook and, and all of these things for more maybe um engagement and we feel that you know i was told in my school years ago oh you need a blog you need to put everything from your lesson on the blogs which was doubling my workload and then the students actually said to me like, that's not fair on the people who turn up to class because the ones who don't turn up to class are getting... So I stopped it, you know? But it was all about this engage. We need to engage more. And that's, again, at the hands of us. So all of the tech that we're using is for engagement rather than maybe for learning or for assessment and uh, things like that. So what we don't do in this sector, this sector, really, is we're not catching or holding on to any of the data data, tomatoes, tomatoes, whatever, that, um, that is being created. There's an, this is a growing sector. This, there's an enormous wealth of uh, understanding and learning and data going on that we could collect in order to bring it back in to boost this for us and for the students. So we're not doing that. And because we're, lot, we're letting all that go, we're not actually putting in any sort of structures. We're not putting it together in a structure, in a framework that we, we can build on that to reinform ourselves you know so where's the learning from us you know and all of you guys you know yourself if you know with um, self-reflection and feedback just even yourself you used an activity who did it work with who did it not work with you know that yourself and you might reevaluate that and you might change that but we don't know collectively 
You know, did it work with Italian students? Did it not work with Spanish students? Why? Right? And how are we feeding that back into to each other? And so one, um, one of the failings of EdTech, as it was seen as the panacea, but it's actually not happened, really. You know, like I think 700 million in Silicon Valley has been invested. Most of those companies are bust because of the empathy gap. A lot of the, the tech um, entrepreneurs aren't teachers. They don't know what it's like to be in the classroom. They don't know what it's like, you know, so there's, there's this disconnect between the, the teachers, the students, and the people creating the technology. So who's the best people to create the technology? Mm -hmm. It's the teachers, you know. Um, and so if we can close that, then we're really strengthening ourselves in this sector. Uh, so this is my video. So my company, what we do is, oh, obviously it's not going to work. I think it's gone. doesn't matter. It's a really cool video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if you want to close out of it, I'll yeah. close out. Uh, so yeah, I've built, um, I say me, I came up with the idea, but I got a developer and I said build this. And I'm very much, my background is very much EAP, foundation year programs, and um, my background is science as well. So I teach, or I have been teaching students to go into the world of science, uh, no, is it, um, is, can, is it not there on the presentation? No, it worked earlier. Anyway, so what you can do with it, I'll try, yeah, on that side. Which one? 14. This one? Yeah. So if you, yeah, there's a little arm. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I'm all about learner autonomy, trying to improve metacognition, trying to improve the, the students, mm. trying to facilitate their ability to go out into the real world, professional and academic, um, and build up their own language skills. Tell me when to put yeah, it. yeah, press now. Sorry. Uh, so what you can do with this, uh, and this is its early phase, um, so what it is, you can take a photo of something you're reading, or if you're reading an article on the internet, you can take a screen grab, and you just take it like a photo, except it's more cool than that, and so in less than 20 seconds, <laughs> in less than 20 seconds, what it did is it detected 312 words. It detected the meaning, the word form, the pronunciation of all of those words, giving also collocation synonyms and phrases with it to create then a list for yourself. So your own vocabulary list. Uh, you can add your own words and things like that. So you get... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just random that I chose this illusion. <laughs> that wasn't chose, that wasn't on purpose. Uh, and so in it, the way we, the way I built it is that um, that it's very much um, kind of focused on pedagogy and metacognition, and that students are removing the things they know, not focusing on what they don't know. And so they create their own lists, and what you saw there as well that we save the source image. So we were talking earlier, Jared, that. We have the words, we look, we can see the frequencies, we don't know where they came from. So that's really important for us as well, that we're, we're finding what words are our students interacting with, where did they come from, and because the list decontextualizes it, they can go back to the source image to connect it back there to see where they found it. So what, uh, where the magic is in that, really, is if you're in your school, you're teaching, if it's for yourself, whatever, you're giving students articles, maybe authentic materials, which I kind of prefer, we all hate course books, obviously. But from that, what we can, on the back end of it through the data, is that we can understand from that what nationalities are having problems with what words, at what time, from what articles, what demographics, are they female, are they male, and what, what age range are they? So we can generate these reports, and then we sprinkle the pedagogy, teacher, fairy, dust, and from those reports that we can create education packs that are better than the dry, boring course materials, that we can then, and that's going to feed back directly to you, directly to your school, for your students, so it's not just what is the most frequently word used, what's the most frequently problem, what's the most uh, problematic word for your students today, in real time. More than that, what we can do with technology is not only are we looking at the words, but we're looking at the sentiment. So it, I can't remember the words that uh, you used it, dirt. They were much more technical than my words, but looking at <laughs> what we use is natural language processing. 
What is the sentiment? Is it positive? Is it negative? What are the key ideas from it? Because there's comprehension as well with the uh, authentic materials, even the ones that are in the books. So what we can do is we can look at to see what do they understand, what do they not understand, which can reinform air teaching to tell us, okay, we need to look at these ideas more, not just the language. So it's that combination of ideas and language together. Um, and so just with Cambridge and all of those guys, I didn't use all the logos, you might say, well, aren't we doing that already? And on reflection, my next slide is probably a bit harsh. No, uh, it's a bit harsh. Not really. Okay, so yes, we, we've seen the, the, the amount of data that there is there, the amount of words that are being collected. But again, it goes into a, a, a database, database, I can't say that word, but it's not coming back directly to the teachers in real time for your students. And that's what we need. Um, because I was looking, now I'm interested to know about some of the other corpus things, because I think we do need to be corpus informed teachers. Um, but some of the ones I was looking at, like, they look like this. Actually, that doesn't look so bad there. But when you get in, this was how I had to sign up, right? And then you get in here, and I was like, oh, God. Mm -hmm. Said, so put in your query, and I was like, I just don't know what's going on here. <laughs> so from UI, UX, from that perspective, it's not easy. And I was just yeah. like, oh, God, I'm home alone. This is awful. <laughs> um, they've left me. I don't know what to do with this information. Uh, so some of the things that we bring into it is that we can have things like all these scary things like AI and machine learning, but really what it's telling us is just telling us what do students understand, what do they not understand, and how can we pre-teach ideas, you know, um, and how can we get messages from that so that we can create more specific, learner-specific materials um, that are going to target the, your students and hopefully improve your your teaching, your classrooms, but also their, their learning outcomes, and also make you valuable as a teacher and a school so that you are indispensable, like there is no way to get rid of you. And so we're just at the start of this, um, so there's a lot more to go and a lot more to be added to it as well. So what we should do really as a sector, um, yeah, well, easy, right, easy to say, yeah, there's lots of things, but what we really need to do fundamentally as a sector is, is realise the potential that's out there and realise that everyone in this room, you know, has ideas and that the power is really in your hands to be able to create and innovate because that's what you do every single day. I didn't realise that I was a creator, but then when I thought about all the lessons I didn't have a book for, I didn't have a printer for, I didn't have anything for, you know, you're always creating, you're always innovating. So if you have things that are missing from the tech or from that side of it, you create them, okay? And um, so that we can create these structured frameworks that are going to feed back into the sector. But also, we have to make things more digestible. We have to make them, you know, it has to be bite-sized, uh, mobile, portable, digestible things that it can feed back to people who don't have the time to go search and true corpus and things like that corporate. So there is potential growth here and this sector doesn't have to be left behind from that. So what EdTech can provide is growth in maybe instruction, learning and maybe even assessment which can come down to self-assessment you know and um, as we're talking about to build up the learner autonomy and stuff like that. But overall I think that it really can provide if we use it and harness the power of it then it can it's, provide a secure future for ELT, but, you know, for, for the people who are really driving that.